Well, good morning or afternoon, evening, whenever it is that you're viewing uh, this video. Uh, hopefully you're watching it on Good Friday as this is our Good Friday uh, kind of message and time together in God's Word. Um, you know, it's interesting and it may seem strange that we refer to today as Good Friday because today is the day that we celebrate uh, Jesus' crucifixion, the fact that he died upon a cross. Uh, but of course, we know that God's plan and God's purpose for that was good to bring salvation to us. And so uh, maybe you're watching this and, and maybe you're struggling even this this year specifically to find the good in Good Friday in that, hey, typically we're together, we're enjoying fellowship at this time. Uh, maybe we have another sister church together with us and, and we're enjoying some some fellowship and um, you know, time together in God's word as we think about the crucifixion. And maybe you're struggling because this year you're at home, you're kind of locked down, you can't, you don't have the freedoms that you typically do. And so maybe even this year, especially, you're struggling with that idea of this being a Good Friday. But I'll assure you this, if, if we can call the single greatest tragedy in human history and the reality that Jesus uh, was murdered, was crucified, that we as human beings crucified the Son of God. If we can call that good, knowing that God had a plan and a purpose of bringing salvation in that, then we can certainly call uh, this Friday that we're experiencing good, even though the circumstances of our life right now may not seem good. We know God has a purpose and a plan in what he is doing, and God is still in control, and, and he is still on his throne. And so we welcome you to our time together as we celebrate uh, Good Friday and have some time in God's Word today. Um, and today we're going to, of course, consider the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, and, and we do this, of course, every time this year. We do it not just on Good Friday. We talk about the cross of Christ really almost on a Sunday, every single Sunday, uh, week by week basis. Um, but we especially try to focus our attention on the crucifixion of Christ during this Good Friday season. And it becomes more and more challenging every year to try to present Christ's crucifixion in some kind of fresh way or fresh perspective or, you know, to try to, you know, shed new insights, that kind of thing. And that's not my goal today. My goal is not to, you know, try to give some kind of fresh perspective or new insight that, you know, the world's never known. Typically when that happens anyway, it's not truthful. Uh, instead, my goal today is I want to bring a little bit of a, a different perspective as far as a biblical, someone in Scripture's perspective of Jesus' crucifixion. And so I want to look at uh, a person in Scripture's life leading up to Jesus' crucifixion uh, and how really his life was prior to Jesus' crucifixion and how Jesus' death and ultimately, as we're going to see on Sunday, his resurrection and uh, the giving of his Holy Spirit really dramatically and radically changed this person's life. So I want us to see how uh, this person had a certain perspective of Jesus leading up to uh, the crucifixion. The person that I want us to consider today and the perspective that I want to look uh, from is he's a very well-known character in, in the Bible. He's one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, as we're going to see, he's one of the closest disciples to Jesus. He had some very tremendous high points in his life, but at the same time, he had many really unbelievable low points in his life as well. So within this range of ups and downs, I think we will be able to find ourselves and find that, that we're somewhere within those, those peaks and valleys that this man we're going to talk about today experienced. Uh, and we can relate our perspective of Christ's crucifixion to ourselves by looking at his perspective as well. So if you haven't guessed it already, we're going to be uh, considering the life of Peter leading up to the crucifixion and how Jesus' death began that process of dramatically changing Peter into the man that he would become after Jesus' resurrection. So we're going to jump around a little bit today. Uh, we're not going to camp out on any one text. So if you have a Bible, you might be able to turn to some of the passages we'll look at. But if not, you can sit back and I'll, I'll be sure to give some of those references and read those verses as well. As we capture Peter's perspective leading up to the crucifixion of Christ. But before we do that... Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll, we'll dive into Scripture and see uh, Peter's perspective prior to the crucifixion. Let's pray. Father, we do lift our time together up to you. We pray that you would give us insight into your word. Um, but Lord, we pray that you would help us not to take for granted the message of the cross and the message of 
uh, the gospel, Lord. We get so accustomed to hearing uh, this story, this account, this historical account, that, Father, it's easy for us to become cold to it. And so I pray that that wouldn't be our heart today, but that you would, would stir our hearts to see, as we look through uh, the perspective of Peter, to see uh, just the dramatic change the cross can make in any, anyone's life, anyone who puts their faith in you. So, Father, be glorified uh, as we uh, celebrate what we call Good Friday, knowing that you are uh, in control, knowing that, uh, Lord, even though this event was a tragedy from a human standpoint, it is also a victory in the sense that Jesus uh, secured our salvation and rose again from the dead. And so, Lord, help us today to give you the glory that is due your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we consider the life of Peter prior to the crucifixion and, and look at his perspective on the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, I want us to examine three characteristics that we find in Peter's life. And the first one is this. We see Peter's faithfulness. Peter's faithfulness. You know, it's, it's interesting. Every time uh, in Scripture, in the Gospel accounts, and I think there's an account in Acts where it lists out the 12 disciples, Peter is always the first one listed, kind of demonstrating that he was a, a, a trusted leader, that he had a position of priority. He was kind of the spokesman of the apostles, as we see, and of the, the 12 disciples, as we see throughout the Gospel accounts. We know that even uh, outside of just the 12 disciples, that Peter was part of that inner three of he and John, uh, James and John that had a kind of a special uh, intimacy with Christ. They experienced uh, events in Christ's life that none of the other disciples experienced, such as Jesus' transfiguration uh, and, of course, the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed and he took those inner three further along into the garden with him. Uh, most of us know that prior to following Jesus, Peter was a fisherman. Uh, he was a fisherman along with James and John and his brother Andrew. And we know that Andrew, Peter's brother, was the one that actually brought him to Christ, brought him to Jesus. And so prior to following Jesus, Peter was actually known as Simon. And many times in Scripture, he's called Simon Peter. Um, but when he first met Jesus and when Jesus first met Peter, he said, he gave him the name. He said, you're Simon, uh, son of Jonah, but... From now on, you're going to be called Cephas or Peter, we could say, which means a, a rock, a small rock or a stone. It's interesting to realize that in the gospel accounts, uh, Peter is actually mentioned uh, more than anyone else other than Jesus. So in all the gospel accounts, uh, just outside of Jesus being mentioned, Peter's name is mentioned more than anyone else. We also see that no one speaks as often as Peter does uh, to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to Peter more than any of the other disciples. So we see kind of the importance of Peter, even in the, the gospel accounts. We know that he expressed a tremendous self-confidence uh, and was typically one of the first disciples to speak up in answering a question that Jesus had. When, when we consider Peter's life before the crucifixion, as I mentioned before, we see some incredible high moments. Uh, as Peter demonstrated his faithfulness as a leader among the disciples and as a follower of Christ. Think about it. Out of all the disciples that saw Jesus walk on the water, Peter was the only one that had the faith to step out of the boat and actually take a few steps on the water. We know that eventually he was overcome by fear uh, and a kind of a lack of faith, but it takes a lot of faith for him to take that step out of the boat. And so we see uh, this tremendous amount of faith in Peter. Shortly after the event where uh, Peter walks on water for a few, few steps as he sees Jesus walking on water, Shortly after that, we see in John chapter 6, what Pastor Justin referenced this past Sunday on Palm Sunday, uh, we see Jesus, of course, uh, he's, he's having conversation with other followers of his that had followed him to the other side of the sea. He had just fed 5,000 of them. They were ready to take him and make, them, make him their king. Uh, we see those difficult sayings that Jesus uh, tells to them that if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part with me. And we see many of his followers leaving and following no more. And then, of course, he turns to his disciples and he says to them, are you guys going to go as well? Peter is the one who spoke up and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? This is in John 6, 68. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So even in spite of the hard sayings, Peter had a tremendous uh, 
faith in who Jesus was. If you have a Bible and you'd like to, turn over to Matthew chapter 16. We'll look at a few verses here as we see again this incredible profession of Peter's faith. Some of these highlights, these high points in his life as we see Peter's faithfulness. If you look at uh, Matthew 16, beginning there in verse 13 through 16, it says, Now when Jesus came into the dis district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you think is the first one to speak up? Verse 16, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we see this tremendous faith. As Peter says, he's the first one to speak up when Jesus says, Who do you guys say that I am? He says that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This amazing faith that Jesus says, Man, you're blessed because God's revealed this to you. So we see this incredible response. Jesus responds uh, by saying, hey, you're Peter, you're, you're Petros, which means a small rock, but upon this Petra, which is a large boulder, I will build uh, my church. The idea is not that Peter's any kind of first pope uh, or that the church is built upon Peter. What he's saying is kind of a play on words that, hey, you're a small rock, but upon this large rock of your profession of faith is what I'm going to build my church upon. And then we see the authority given to Peter in verse 19 uh, is the authority that's given to all of us as believers uh, and the ability to say, based on someone's profession of faith, if they're claiming that they've trusted Christ as Savior, based on that profession, they have eternal life. If the substance of their profession is true, they have eternal life. And if someone does not profess faith in Christ, then we can certainly say they don't have eternal life. So it's not as though... Uh, as many people take this, that, P that Peter's some kind of first pope, um, because in reality, if you keep reading in the text, as we're going to see later on in Matthew 16, just a few verses later, uh, if Jesus was establishing him as the first pope, uh, he probably would have taken that position away pretty quickly. Uh, skip down to Matthew 16, 21 to 23. It says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he, that's Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So it's amazing that we see this incredible high point in Peter's life in chapter 16, as he professes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then just a few verses later, we see this very low point uh, as, as basically uh, Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan. Uh, he never talked to the other disciples in that harsh of a way, um, but Peter, of course, was one that was vocal, and of course, he's the only one of the disciples that rebuked Jesus, as we see here. So we've, we've seen Peter's faithfulness. We've seen kind of those high points in his life. But secondly, I want us to think about Peter's failures. Peter's failures, because just as he had very many high points in his life, there are a lot of low points as well. In Matthew 16, 23, as we just referenced, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, your hindrance to me. Um, as we have considered Peter's faithfulness prior to Jesus' death, we also have to consider these failures. Uh, he had a lot of high moments, but in his self-confidence and in his boldness, he also found himself having to put his foot in his mouth many times, far too often. Um, if, we, if we kind of keep flashing forward in the Gospel of Matthew, we see in Matthew 17, right after Jesus is uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration and his glory is revealed, and we see there a picture of Moses and Elijah there, uh, Peter, not knowing what to say, but, but being so bold and so self-confident, he kind of says, hey, I, how about I build a tent for you and Moses and Elijah, and even as he's speaking, the text tells us in Matthew 17, God spoke from heaven and said, this is my son, essentially saying, don't put Moses and Elijah on the same level as my son Jesus. And so here we see Peter 
failing by having to kind of stick his foot in his mouth, as it were. We see his self-confidence and his boldness at the Passover meal when Jesus goes to wash the disciples' feet. And as he comes to Peter, Peter says, you're never going to wash my feet. And Jesus has to kind of correct him, right? Well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Well, then Peter, instead of just saying, okay, go ahead, he goes a step further. Well, then wash all of me. And Jesus, again, has to correct him and say, well, look, if, if you're cleansed by me, you don't need to be washed all over. And so Peter, we see being very self-confident, very bold, um, willing to kind of speak before he really thinks. And, and because of that, there was a lot of correction that Jesus had to bring into his life. So we see, uh, we see this throughout, throughout Peter's life. If you flip over to Matthew 26, I want us to see, again, this self-confidence that Peter had and, and this failure that he had because he boldly and self-confidently proclaims uh, in Matthew 26, 33, that after Jesus basically is foreshadowing that he's about to go to Jerusalem, he's going to die, uh, he's going to be crucified, he's going to rise again from the dead. Um, and he says, because of that, because I'm going to be struck as your shepherd, you guys are going to be scattered away. You guys are going to fall away and be scattered and disperse. And we see in Matthew 26, 33, Peter says very confidently, very self-confidently, very boldly, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away, right? Very bold in his, his self-confidence. But again, Jesus corrects Peter by saying the very next verse in verse 34, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. But again, Peter in his self-confidence and his boldness in the very next verse, he says, Look, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And we know, of course, what happened. A short time later, as Jesus is fervently praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see that even though Peter was saying that he was willing to die for Jesus, he's not even willing to stay awake and pray as Jesus had asked him. Jesus, of course, is, is uh, suffering in the sense of he knows he's about to go to the cross to bear God's wrath against the sin of the world. And he, he's so distressed, he's praying to the Father, he's sweating drops of blood, he's asking if there's any way for this cup to to be removed, that it be removed. But Jesus says, of course, nevertheless, not what I will, but you will. And all the while that's going on as he's preparing to go to the cross, he's asking Peter and the other three uh, inner disciples, James and John, to pray. What does he find them three times? He finds them sleeping. And so we see this boldness not backed up, his, his failures. We see, see his failures to back up what he said. We see this boldness again just a little while later in the gospel accounts where as uh, Jesus is about to be arrested, Peter steps in and seems to demonstrate that he's willing to die because he takes his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. And of course, Jesus, again, has to correct him. Put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And so again, uh, Jesus, of course, heals that servant's ear. Um, Peter's not arrested. Nothing comes of it. But again, we see Peter just acting uh, very boldly in his own self-confidence, uh, not really thinking before he speaks or before he acts. And we know we get to kind of the lowest point, we could say, in Peter's life. As Jesus had told him, you're going you're gonna to deny me three times. Peter in his self-confidence said, that's never going to happen. Even if I have to die, I'll never deny you. Well, a short time later, Peter uh, is there in the courtyard and there's several people, uh, servant girls that come up and say, hey, aren't you a follower of Christ? And three times we see Jesus, or we see Peter denying Jesus. Three separate times. He was confident in himself. Uh, he thought he was faithful. He thought, hey, if, if, even if everybody else leaves you, I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to die for you. We see this ultimate failure, right? His confidence, his trust was in him, himself. And we see his failures breaking him. When he denies Christ and as the rooster crows, he realizes, realizes what he's done, and he goes away weeping bitterly, the text tells us. You know, it's interesting, prior to this, in Luke's account of Jesus foretelling Peter's denial, Jesus says this to Peter. This is in Luke 22, 31 to 32. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned again, Strengthen your brothers. Now, it's interesting to realize that Jesus 
Uh, Jesus is telling Peter that Satan wants to sift him, right? The idea of sifting is that idea of when you have wheat, uh, you're, you're throwing it in the air and you're allowing the wind to blow the chaff or the bad part, the, the wasteful part, away. And the grain, the part that you want to keep, uh, comes back down and, and whatever you're, you're, you're sifting that in. And so what he's saying is, hey, Satan wants to sift you, but Jesus' response isn't, but I've told him not to. Instead, Jesus' response is, I've prayed for you, what? That your faith may not fail. In other words, Jesus was going to allow, God was going to allow Satan to sift Peter so that those things in his life that weren't useful, that chaff, could be taken away and that what was useful would be left. And that is the third thing we see uh, today, Peter's faith. We've seen Peter's faithfulness, his trust in himself. We've seen his failures. He couldn't back up what he uh, said many times or, or what he thought. But we see, lastly, Peter's faith. Peter's failures were actually meant to increase his faith. And so we see that Jesus was allowing Satan to sift Peter so that he would no longer fall back onto his own self-confidence and his own sense of faithfulness, but that all that, would be all that would be left, all that would be remaining was his faith in Jesus. You know, we realize that Peter's faith up to this point was a little bit misplaced. Um, just, just as uh, Pastor Justin talked about last week, most of those in Israel were looking to Jesus to be this kind of political uh, king that would come along that would wipe out Roman oppression and would set up God's kingdom there on earth. And that's, that's really no different from what Peter thought. Peter thought he was the son of God, thought he was the Messiah, but he had a misplaced faith in what Jesus had come to do. He didn't realize why Jesus needed to die. And so when Jesus tells him, uh, hey, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die and rise from the dead, that, that doesn't fit with Peter's uh, thinking. And so his faith is somewhat misplaced, but... He still believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, and that, of course, he had come to earth for some purpose, yet he didn't understand fully what this purpose was. So Peter failed to understand that he had an even greater need, just as the people of Israel did. He failed to understand that he didn't just need a political figure to step in and, and remove the oppression that he was experiencing in an earthly sense. What Peter needed and what all of us need is a Savior. He had failed, he had sinned, he had denied the very one who had come to save him. And so he needed a savior. He needed forgiveness. He needed cleansing. You know, he had a lot of confidence in himself and in his abilities. Uh, he probably thought of, that out of all the followers of Christ, he was the best and most reliable one. In fact, based on what he said, he definitely believed that. And so this gave him a false assurance that his position and therefore, probably his relationship with God was based on his merits, right? It was based on the fact that he was going to be faithful, that he wasn't going to fail. But ultimately, that's what he did fail. He ultimately did do what he hoped not to do. He failed. He wasn't faithful to the end in and of himself. He didn't realize that just like every one of us, he, he's, he was a sinner separated from a holy God because of his sin. And no amount of sacrifices as he was uh, practicing Old Testament Judaism prior to Jesus, no amount of, of animal sacrifices could cleanse the sin that he experienced. There needed to be an ultimate sacrifice, which was Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, being sacrificed for the sin of the world. And the same is true for us. Because we sin, we need a Savior desperately. And that is why it was necessary for Jesus to die. That is why we call today Good Friday, because Jesus, on that day, lived, he lived a perfect life. And on that day, he took the sin of the world, my sin and your sin and Peter's sin and everyone's sin upon himself. And he paid the penalty for that sin. He bore God's wrath against that sin on the cross as he died, as he was crucified, so that he could provide forgiveness, so that he could be that sacrifice for sin once and for all. At the moment of Peter's denial, all the way through Jesus' death and burial, Peter's faith was shaken, but it wasn't completely destroyed. Um, his faith prior had been, of course, in himself, but that faith in himself was gone because he had failed. His faith 
prior to this had been somewhat in his view of why Jesus had come, that he was going to set up an earthly kingdom right then and there. But just like everything else, that chaff had been sifted away. But all that was left in Peter after the, his denial and after Christ's crucifixion prior to the resurrection was just a little bit of faith. He still, I believe, uh, knew that Jesus was the Son of God, still believed that he was the Messiah. And I think that's why, as, we, as we're going to see on Sunday, that he, his willingness to go to the grave, to go to the tomb, because there was a little bit of faith there. And every, every other trust he had and everything else was gone, but his little bit of faith in Jesus still remained. And as we're going to see on Sunday, God took that little bit of faith that existed prior to the crucifixion and through the resurrection, as Pastor Justin is going to talk about, he began to increase that faith so that Peter could then strengthen his brothers and sisters who also had that same faith in Christ as their Savior. And so we find in Peter a man who was on a roller coaster ride of life, right? Lots of ups, lots of high points, lots of downs. And for us, we can probably experience the same thing in life. We have our ups and our downs in life. Yeah, we probably haven't experienced the, the highest of highs that he's experienced. And I'm guessing we probably haven't experienced the lowest of lows that he's experienced either in denying Christ. And so in some ways, we can relate to Peter in the sense that at times we can become way too self-confident. We can become way too uh, focused on ourselves, thinking that we're good, thinking that our relationship with God is somehow uh, dependent upon how we, in our own strength, live out uh, our life and as we care for others, that sort of thing, it's, it's all about us and our self-confidence. We can think that many times. We can also be like Peter in the fact that we experience failures. We might be self-confident and, and maybe in times where we do wrong and we sin, we kind of come back and say, God, I'll never do it again. Well, what happens? We fall into that sin again. We experience the, the highs and the lows. We experience those times of faithfulness and those times of failure. But just like Peter, we cannot put our faith in our faithfulness, and we cannot fester in our failures. Instead, we must realize that our faith in Jesus' finished work will forgive our failures and will fuel our faithfulness. God allows the circumstances of our lives to sift out that in us which isn't useful so that what remains is genuine faith in him. Just think about the current circumstances that we're going through today and how God has used our circumstances to take away many of the things that we find comfort or security in. He's taken away our faith in those false securities of our jobs or our money or even our health. And no longer can we fall back on those things anymore. And so what's left? If we've trusted Christ as Savior, then we, we fall back, of course, on our faith. And look how God is increasing the faith of those who have trusted him and those who put their faith in him. Through this time, it has been a growing experience for us as believers because we've got to become more dependent, not upon ourselves, not upon these things that are temporary, but only we can only be dependent upon Christ and, and what God offers us uh, and as far as the salvation he provides through Jesus. But maybe you're watching today and you've been stripped of these false assurances. Maybe you're watching this and you've lost your job. Maybe you've seen your bank account or your 401k or whatever it may, may be dwindle. You don't have that security of, of money. Maybe, maybe you're watching this today and you're experiencing health complications, either, either directly because of this virus or because of other circumstances surrounding it. And maybe you've all those things have been sifted out of your life and you've realized there's nothing to fall back on because you don't even have a faith in Christ. But maybe it's that reality that God is using those things and sifting those things away to show you your need for him. Maybe he's taking those false assurances away so that today will be the day that you put your faith in Christ. Maybe he's using those experiences to sift out that, that which is not useful so that you will find faith in Christ. And that's the message of Good Friday, that Jesus, the very God, creator of the universe, uh, the second person, as we say, of the Trinity, became a man, put on human flesh, lived a sinless life, 
died upon a cross, bearing the sin of the world upon himself, bearing God's wrath uh, toward that sin. And then, of course, as we're going to talk about Sunday, he rose three days later, showing that he had defeated sin and death once and for all. So that those who will turn from their sin, those who will turn from their self-reliance and their self-confidence in themselves as though we can earn our, our merit before God or our standing before God, those who turn from their sin and their self-confidence and put their faith in what Christ has done can have eternal life. And that's why we can call this Good Friday good, because Christ provides salvation. So if you're watching this today and you've never done that, you've never put your faith in Christ, maybe you're placing your faith in your own faithfulness to earn God's favor. You need to let God strip that away so that you have empty hands to come to him. Maybe you're watching this and you're, you're festering in your failures. You're living in shame and guilt thinking that there's no way God could ever forgive you. Well, let go of that. Allow God to strip that away so that you can, just as the old hymn says, you can come to the cross with empty hands. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. There's no amount of good works that you can hold on to, no sins that you're holding on to as though Christ can't forgive them, but you're coming to the cross with empty hands just as you are. And as you come just as you are with empty hands, God will change you like we're going to see he changed Peter's life uh, on Sunday after, uh, after the resurrection and after he poured out his spirit. Come to him just as you are, trusting that he can take you as you are and make you what he would have you to be. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the perspective of Peter's life and that, Lord, we can relate with his ups and downs. Lord, all of us experience that, maybe not to the extent Peter did, but we can all relate in that we have times where we feel like we're doing pretty good. And Father, there are times, many times, that we feel like we are struggling, that we are uh, living in guilt and shame. And we thank you that the cross uh, helps us to put our faith not in our good, good deeds, not in our failures and as though they're keeping us away from you, but our faith is completely in what Christ has done. And so I pray that we would meditate on this as believers and that we would trust you by faith uh, as we experience faithfulness, that it wouldn't be in and of ourselves, but that our faith would be the thing fueling our faithfulness and that we wouldn't live in shame and guilt, but we confess our sin and trust in the forgiveness that's offered in Christ. And Father, my prayer is for those who may be watching this who have never put their faith in you, that today they would let go of whatever's holding them back. They would let go of their, their good works that they think are pleasing to you, that they would let go of their failures that they think you could never forgive, and that they would come to you empty-handed just as they are so that you could take them and make them what you desire them to be. So, Father, may you be glorified in us and through us. And we pray this in your Son's name. Amen.